I've just returned from the U.S. Ambassador's residence here in Ottawa, where I sat down with Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Here's our conversation. Have a listen. Secretary Blinken, welcome to Canada and welcome thank to Power you. in Politics. It's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for making the time for this. Thanks for having me. I, I want to stop, start off on an area that is uh, both you and, and Minister Jolie spoke about of uh, primary concern and priority for mm. both our countries, and that is uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine, yes. Putin's war mm. on Ukraine. And in particular, look, looking ahead to the G20 mm. in a few weeks, uh, does President Biden have any plans to meet with Vladimir Putin there? No, he doesn't. And why is that? What we've seen uh, is Russia and President Putin have no interest in any kind of meaningful diplomacy to end the aggression they've committed against Ukraine. In fact, quite the opposite. We've seen a doubling, a tripling down of that aggression, the mobilization of more Russian forces, the purported annexation of Ukrainian territory, the loose talk about nuclear weapons, and now this horrific campaign uh, against all of the uh, basic infrastructure of Ukraine so that Ukrainians don't have power, don't have lights, don't have heat uh, as we get into the winter. So every sign uh, is pointing to a doubling and tripling down, despite the fact that the Ukrainians continue to take territory uh, back from Russia that was seized in the first months of this uh, aggression. So if there were a space for meaningful diplomacy, uh, we take it, but we don't see that. And in any event, this has to be resolved directly between Russia and Ukraine. Um, so if Russia actually wants to talk and is serious about it, it should be talking with the Ukrainian government. Does it run counter to all that you've said that Russia is even going to be there? Uh, you know, uh, we've seen around the world that uh, Russia's actions have uh, created uh, deep uh, opposition and, uh, and, and, and more. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, 143 countries at the United Nations at the General Assembly stood up together to condemn the purported annexations of territory by Russia and Ukraine. 143 countries, so two-thirds of, uh, of the world. Uh, I think that uh, President Putin is facing this wherever he goes, even from countries that are, are closer to Russia or have been historically, uh, making known their concerns about what Russia is doing. Uh, uh, true, that all, that, that's all true. The reason I ask mm -hmm. is, is uh, simply uh, you know, to, to get closer to whether or not the position is uh, of your administration that Russia should not be there. Should they be excluded from the G20? It's something the Canadian government mm -hmm. has expressed uh, a desire to see. Is that a desire you share? Well, it's hard to see Russia uh, playing uh, a uh, appropriate, positive uh, role in critical institutions, starting with the UN Security Council, when it is right now the number one aggressor against the basic principles that underlie most of these institutions, starting with the UN uh, and including the United Nations Charter. So I think this is a real, uh, a real problem, uh, a, real, a real challenge, um, and it certainly makes it increasingly hard to do, um, uh, to do business, but we're finding in the G20, uh, at the UN, that uh, other countries continue to work together to try to advance the global good. Um, Russia, uh, given what it's doing now, it's hard to see how it participates effectively in any of that. Is there any explicit campaign, though, led by, for example, your administration or your country, to exclude them from the G20? Right now, what we're focused on is making sure that we're doing everything we can to support Ukraine um, and giving it the uh, equipment that it needs to defend itself against the Russian aggression and to take back the land that's been seized, to exert pressure on Russia through sanctions, through export controls that are having a real, a, a real impact on what Russia is able to do going forward, as well as, of course, is necessary to shore up our own defenses in case the Russian aggression moves elsewhere. That's what we're doing through NATO, very in close collaboration with Canada. Uh, and uh, our other partners. That's where our focus is. And I understand that focus, and I have a few questions mm -hmm. about that level of support and the nature of it in just a moment. I, I just want to be explicit because um, I think a lot of people watching have listened to your government and our own government and other Western governments talk about uh, the, the Vladimir Putin and the nature of that aggression. And uh, I, I gather from your response that there will be no explicit push to kick them out of the G20. Well, as a, pra as a practical matter, uh, countries, it's impossible. Uh, countries have to decide uh, the nature of their relationship with Russia as it pursues this aggression against Ukraine, whether that's on a bilateral basis or in the context of important international groupings like the G20 or, for that matter, uh, the Security Council. Countries need to continue uh, to do the vital work of these organizations and these institutions. That's what we're focused on. When you uh, refer to the support that the United States has provided for Ukraine throughout all of this and, and the pledges for continued mm. support, you've characterized it as steadfast. Mm -hmm. 
Can you be sure or can you guarantee uh, that it will remain so if the Democrats lose the House? What we've seen to date in the United States is strong bipartisan support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, I've been on visits to Ukraine, to surrounding countries, including Poland, with bipartisan delegations from our Congress, from our House, from our Senate. And what I've heard across the board from Republicans and Democrats alike is strong support, uh, determined support for Ukraine in making sure that it can continue to stand against the Russian aggression. Um, I don't see that fundamentally changing. Now, no one can ever predict uh, the future, but based on what we've seen to date, um, I think uh, the support is there, it's steadfast, and it's bipartisan. Uh, if I could respectfully challenge you mm. on that, uh, Secretary, uh, just with the, the, the fundamentals of that not changing, mm. uh, I would point to example House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, mm. uh, poised to potentially take over of spe as mm. Speaker uh, if the GOP wins a majority, who said in an interview two weeks ago that Republicans are not going to write a blank check to Ukraine at a time of economic recession. More than half of all Republicans running for congressional and state offices in the midterm elections deny the legitimacy of your administration mm. by denying the outcome of the last election. Mm. The, your counterpart in Ukraine just yesterday expressed concern over the mm -hmm. statements from those individuals mm -hmm. and what it could mean for your administration's support of their country. Is it fair to say that, that that support might not be as steadfast as you're telling your allies it is right now? Well, first, one of the best parts of my job is I don't do politics. Uh, I certainly don't do politics at home, or for that matter, in, in other countries. So all I can look at is um, what the policies we're pursuing, as well as the, what I'm hearing myself from those that we're working with, starting with members of Congress. And what I'm hearing, at least as of now, is ongoing support for Ukraine. That's manifesting itself in support that Congress has to provide. Uh, it's also in the support that the administration is providing directly. For example, just this week we did our 24th, what we call drawdown, of our own defense equipment going to, to Ukraine, the 24th time we've sent to Ukraine the equipment that needs to defend itself. Uh, but all I can tell you is this, my own conversations, what I'm hearing, my consultations with Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, is the support is strong. And I know it's not, it's your job not to do politics, mm -hmm. it's mine to sometimes <laughs> ask about the risk of it. Could you admit or would you concede there is a risk? There's, for all of us, for every country involved uh, in this, uh, one of the questions has been, um, can we effectively sustain the support. And I think at virtually every uh, step along the road, there have been predictions, oh, this, 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 first of all, that the support wouldn't be there to begin with. The countries won't take the uh, unprecedented steps that we've taken on sanctions, on export controls. Well, we did. And then people said, well, that's not going to be sustained. The support's going to fade. Um, there's going to be pressure against it. Well, it has. We're now nine months or so in. Uh, and it continues. So, you know, I've heard this uh, pretty much every, uh, as I said, every step along the way. Uh, I've seen the support uh, continue and grow, indeed, in many ways, even more resolute, because what we're seeing happening, what the world is seeing happening in Ukraine uh, is so horrific. And now, with Putin literally uh, trying to take out the entire power system in, in Ukraine so that people will suffer, um, that uh, also, I think, uh, sends a strong message to countries around the world that uh, we need to continue to support the Ukrainians. And just quickly before I let you go, con converse to that is, uh, is adversaries to both Canada and the mm -hmm. U.S. who are actually, uh, there are signs actively supporting what Russia mm -hmm. is doing, and, and more specifically I'm, I'm speaking about Iran. Yeah. Given the current context, both within Iran and its actions towards Russia, is the JCPOA dead? Right now, the world is focused on, on two things. The world is focused on the incredibly courageous women uh, of Iran who are out in the, in the streets virtually every day uh, speaking up, speaking out at incredible danger for their basic rights. Uh, and that's where our focus is as well. Um, at the same time, we also have the Iranians supplying the Russians with, with drones uh, that are being used to kill innocent people in, in Ukraine. And the world is increasingly focused on that too. Um, so we've taken steps to de in both situations, for example, with the, with the protests, not only speaking up uh, in support and in solidarity with those who are trying to um, simply uh, speak out for their own rights, but also trying to make sure that um, uh, communications technology uh, could get to those people so that they can communicate with themselves and with the rest of the world. We sanctioned the so-called morality police and others who are responsible for this terrible repression of the Iranian people. At the same time, uh, we're going at the 
drone networks that uh, are producing and trying to move these things uh, to Russia and, uh, and other actors. We've sanctioned them uh, now for the, for the second time. Uh, we're looking at ways to, uh, to disrupt them as well as to harden Ukraine's defenses. As to the JCPOA, uh, we've said uh, for some time that uh, there's no forward movement on that because the Iranians have continued to try to inject extraneous, unrelated issues into the conversation. So uh, as, as we speak, it's, it's, it's not moving forward. But again, with respect, is it, is it dead forever? And, and I ask because not just because of the extraneous things that made it difficult mm -hmm. to negotiate in that instance, mm -hmm. but what's happening right now? I mean, the regime that you would be essentially uh, partially legitimizing by negotiating with is killing people who are protesting against it. Is that a tenable position for your government? When the original JCPOA was negotiated, Iran was engaged in a variety of um, profoundly objectionable actions, um, support for terrorism, uh, destabilizing activities uh, in the Middle East, of course, its own abuse of, of human rights. Uh, and what we said at the time in, in negotiating the agreement was uh, Iran uh, is taking all of these actions and Iran with a nuclear weapon is likely to be even worse because it will believe it can act with even greater impunity when it comes to all of the activities it's engaged in, in the region and beyond, uh, that, that we object to. So the agreement has always been uh, about itself, uh, taking one problem off the board, putting Iran's nuclear program in a box. The agreement did that successfully. Unfortunately, pulling out of the agreement, uh, Iran then had an excuse to restart the nuclear program, and it's now gotten out of the box that we put it in. But can very, you see though, sorry, pardon the interruption, mm, I, I just don't, I know I'm running out of time. Can, can you see how those who are protesting right now would see any positive or any sort of green light towards mm -hmm. any kind of negotiation with the regi regime that is suppressing them as not standing in solidarity with them, as sort of tipping your thumb towards legitimizing the regime? So this is not about legitimizing the regime, it's about dealing with a very specific problem that this regime poses among, unfortunately, many problems, including uh, this repression of its own people the provision of weapons to all sorts of uh, destabilizing and, and bad actors around the world, and uh, an incredibly dangerous nuclear program that actually makes it even more dangerous and uh, more able to act with impunity in, in uh, repressing its own people and in providing uh, weapons or other things to uh, actors that are doing bad things, whether it's in the Middle East or beyond. The bottom line is this, when it comes to the JCPOA or anything else, we're not going to do anything that we do not believe advances the national security of the United States, first and foremost, that's my number one responsibility, uh, and uh, make at least a little bit less dangerous uh, a regime that is demonstrating its danger in a multiplicity of places. Secretary, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. I Thank appreciate you. it. Pleasure Good to be you. with you. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thanks. Right after that interview, the Secretary of State headed over to Parliament Hill. That's where we will go right now because he's just met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We'll show you some of that at the moment. Let's head over there. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Please have a seat. Uh, what a real pleasure uh, to welcome Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken to Ottawa. Uh, Tony, it's so great to see you. We have so much to talk about, uh, not just uh, uh, you know, incredibly close ties and lots of things we're working on together for the benefit of our citizens to uh, counter inflation, to support people in difficult times. Uh, but we're engaged side by side around the world. Obviously, Ukraine top of mind as we continue to stand uh, with Ukraine against Russia uh, and standing up for democracies and bringing people from around the world to understand how important it is. Uh, we're standing together on Iran where uh, the courageous women standing up against this murderous regime are inspiring but uh, uh, also challenging us to do more to support them. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Haiti where the situation is heartbreaking. Uh, where there's uh, much that we can do, but we're uh, uh, busy engaging very much with local and regional partners to make sure uh, that it is uh, done right. And uh, in the coming weeks, we'll be uh, seeing each other quite a bit over in Asia as Indeed. we uh, uh, deepen uh, the work that we're doing as fellow Pacific nations uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, as we meet at the G20, at the, uh, at the APEC summit and various other summits where uh, Canada and the United States continue to work side by side on big issues uh, for the benefit of our citizens, but also for uh, prosperity, stability, and better opportunities for people around the world. 
C'est un énorme plaisir d'accueillir uh, le secrétaire Prime Minister de l'État. Vous êtes en train de regarder une vidéo du Premier ministre de l'État, le secrétaire de l'État, le Premier ministre de l'État, Anthony Blinken. Le Premier ministre parle français momentanément, donc répétant les commentaires qu'il a juste fait en anglais, qui étaient essentiellement les items sur l'agenda pour le Premier ministre et le secrétaire de l'État, ainsi que le ministre de l'Intérieur, le ministre de l'Intérieur, le ministre de l'Intérieur, Mélanie Jolie, l'Ukraine, le chef parmi ces items, sans aucune surprise. Les deux, le secrétaire de l'État et le ministre de l'Intérieur, ont expliqué certaines des choses the uh, ways in which they plan or their administrations plan to support Ukraine in their efforts uh, with Russia, with Russia's aggression towards that country. Uh, a number of other items mentioned, I'll pick up particularly on one uh, before we head back there uh, and uh, the Secretary of State begins speaking English again. One of them, of course, Haiti. Uh, lots of speculation that the U.S. is asking Canada to lead a, a security mission of sorts in Haiti uh, and no direct confirmation of that from either the Prime Minister in those remarks or earlier earlier today from Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. We'll look, of course, to get some more details on that throughout the evening uh, and bring them to you as they become available. As I said, the Prime Minister just speaking uh, some words in French after meeting with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and we do expect Secretary Blinken to make some remarks about the meeting momentarily as well. So we'll take a listen in right now. It's such a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be with, uh, with the Prime Minister, grateful for the, uh, the time and also grateful for the conversation that I know we're going to have. We had, uh, Melanie and I had um, a terrific uh, working session uh, over lunch. And I think everything that the, the Prime Minister uh, just touched on was front and center in our discussions. And I think the bottom line is this. Um, our two countries are the two most integrated countries in the world. And every single day, our people are working together, studying together, visiting together, and that's having a profoundly positive impact uh, on, on both countries. Um, the more uh, integrated we are, the more we're doing together, the stronger our communities uh, and our economies are going to be. Uh, we're building a more and more integrated North America uh, that's going to make, uh, I think, a profound difference in the lives of, uh, of our people. But as the Prime Minister said, we also face challenges together well beyond uh, this uh, hemisphere that we, uh, that we share in the hemisphere itself. Uh, but also beyond it. And in looking at those challenges, whether it's uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, whether it's what we're seeing on the streets uh, of, uh, of Iran uh, today, whether it's uh, the terrible burden that the people of Haiti are carrying, uh, the thing that gives me confidence and optimism that we can meet the challenges is the fact that we're working so closely together. Uh, I think both of us start from the conviction that uh, not one of the problems that is either having an effect on our own people or that we need to deal with uh, around the world can be solved by any one of us acting alone. Uh, the more we find ways to coordinate, to cooperate, uh, to work together, the more effective we're going to be. And that's the hallmark of what the United States and Canada are doing uh, together. And we're doing this uh, not only in our own hemisphere, not only uh, in Europe when it comes to, um, uh, to Ukraine, but also increasingly in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in the Arctic. We're both Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, we're both Arctic countries. Uh, and we spent some time talking about that because uh, so much of the future in different ways will be written in those places. So for us, having this almost uh, permanent day in, day out contact, as well as the opportunity to have these conversations, couldn't be more important. And I have to say, we could not be more grateful to have uh, a partner in Canada. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Thank you so much. So, so that is Secretary of State Antony Blinken alongside uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau making some remarks to reporters assembled there for a little bit of a photo op. You heard our interview with the Secretary right before that. To comment on some of what you heard, we've convened a special panel of former foreign affairs ministers. Let's bring in John Manley, who served in that capacity under Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, and Peter McKay, who served as Minister of Foreign Affairs in Prime Minister Stephen Harper's government. Hello to both of you. Thank you very much for making the time. Uh, Mr. McKay, I wanted to start with you because I think you know our audience will be well acquainted with a lot of the irritants in the relationship between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, do you think it's fair to say on issues of foreign policy, uh, there sounds like today there there is a high degree of alignment? What is your sense of that? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment, uh, Vasya. I think that uh, based on what the Secretary of State had to say it was very friendly. I'm sure John would agree. We've uh, we've had similar bilaterals where uh, it's incumbent upon one another to to stress that important uh, bilateral relationship, but also working together internationally. And he, uh, of course, touched on uh, one of the main topics, one of the, the the 
issues that is bedeviling the world right now, and that is the aggression of the Russians, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Haiti, again, has been an issue that has been around for a very long time. I remember in 2010, where Canada played a very leading role in the compassionate response to the terrible earthquake. And, and Canada, of course, has a lot of uh, history in terms of, of their, their attachment to Haiti. There are a lot of uh, Haitian Canadians, and we have, uh, of course, the French-speaking component. So I suspect that there will be more coming out of these discussions as, as far as an ask of Canada to be more proactive in the region. And then he didn't touch much on, on China and the Indo-Pacific, although it was mentioned, mm -hmm. but that is a, a prominent uh, discussion that will continue well into the future. And I thought it was interesting when you pushed him on uh, sort of the, the, the role in which countries can play in imposing sanctions and possibly considering removing Russia from the G20 uh, Canada, again, was a leader in getting Russia pulled out of the then G8 as a result of their initial invasion of Crimea. So a lot of uh, a lot of discussion, to be sure. The action items remain to be seen. Let, let's pick up on, on some of the threads, uh, Mr. McKay out there, Mr. Manley, and in particular U Ukraine and the support for it. Uh, I know that the secretary didn't want to wade into politics, but politics is a big part of what's going on in the United States right now, in particular with you know the midterms happening very soon and an expected change uh, in the makeup of the House in particular. A lot of, uh, in fact, even, even 30 Democrats this week who wrote a letter are, are reticent to support the administration's explicit position and continuing with steadfast support for Ukraine. Do you think that uh, there is some risk to, the, to that support in the future? Well, I think there's probably some risk to it. Um, I mean, let's face the reality here that this is costing a lot of money and it's it's depleting um, military supplies for even countries as large as the United States um, that are pouring their equipment and materials into, the, into Ukraine. Um, and I'm sure there are some in their defense establishment that are thinking that they are perhaps making themselves a little bit more vulnerable than they should be, given that uh, it takes time to replace some of that ordinance and, uh, and, and equipment. So I, I think there are a number of factors at play here. Um, and, uh, you know, the biggest one maybe is that uh, we in Western societies tend to have a pretty short attention span, the truth is. And while Ukraine dominated every newscast for weeks, maybe even into months, increasingly it's not the lead item. It's falling down the hierarchy of stories. And when do uh, Canadians, Americans, uh, Europeans begin to lose interest in this and move on to other crises, uh, particularly domestic economic crises. Uh, well, look, both of you have occupied uh, the role that, for example, Mel Melanesia Lee does right now. You, you, you've worked alongside Secretary of State. If, in fact, Mr. McKay, that's the worry that you know some of the support might not sustain itself because there are huge domestic issues everywhere. To be fair, like the cost of living and, and, and so many things that, that that governments are dealing with. I mean, how do you try and counter that in that role? And are meetings like this important well, for that? Well, they're, they're critically important in how you communicate the priorities uh, of your country. And, and John is absolutely right. As the, the old expression goes, when the, the water tables get low in the Serengeti, the animals look at each other differently. And we're seeing <laughs> now many competing uh, crises externally, but you know, going to uh, fill up your tank of gas and looking at your grocery bill is, is a crisis for the average Canadian family and, and how they're going to make ends meet and pay their power bill or buy groceries and medicine. So a lot of that is weighing heavily on Canadians' minds as they watch the news. They, they did speak a little bit about uh, what's going on in Iran. That is going to continue, I suspect, well into the future. It's, a, it's turning into a full-blown revolution. That impacts the mindset of a lot of Canadians, particularly Canadian women. I don't have to look beyond my own household to know that this is a, is a very important moment in time, as we've seen previously. I did find it interesting, and this is, to come back to your question, Vasi, this is a, uh, an important tie-in in terms of the Russian aggression references to the Arctic. 
who, while it's easy to forget, the, the Russians are our northern neighbors across a body of water, and they're recapitalizing airfields and putting a lot of uh, military uh, in present in the in the uh, in the Arctic. And so we have to be conscious of that and work closely with the Americans through NORAD and perhaps in the future through NATO to protect our own sovereignty and to ensure that we're we're going to be sufficiently protected from our northern flank. So these discussions with our closest uh, ally, trading partner and, and military partner are extremely important as, uh, as the government of Canada communicates to the Canadian population why certain policy decisions are being made and why certain expenditures are being made, particularly when it comes to massive uh, expense of prosecuting uh, a war, even if you're just putting in equipment, uh, even a humanitarian response, as we, we may very well see in Haiti in the near future. Those are huge dollars that Canadians are going to ask hard questions about when they're dibbing, digging deep in their own pockets to make ends meet. Uh, final question to you, Mr. Manley. I, I, I remember during the NAFTA, you know, this, the new NAFTA negotiations, speaking to both uh, you and Mr. McKay frequently during those, it, that relationship between our two countries was at the forefront, I think, of many Can Canadians' minds. As that, that irritant where trade is concerned has, has receded, at least in, in, the, in the way it's framed or, or the amount we consume it, I'm, I'm wondering what your overall assessment is, though, uh, of where the relationship stands. And, and I'll tell you why I'm asking. I mean, behind the scenes, many people involved in that relationship are telling me that, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act is a, a big threat to the potential for investment in this country, that there is a lot of worry about uh, some of the more protectionist uh, leanings uh, uh, of the current administration. I'm wondering your, your, if you were to you know, headline the relationship between our two countries now following this meeting and knowing what you do, what would you say? Well, the first thing I'd say, Vashi, is uh, the thematics of today's meetings, both as you uh, asked questions about it, as the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State summed it up, is very positive because these are, these are um, foreign policy issues in which Canada actually plays an important role, maybe even a vital role in, on the world stage where we can be useful and helpful to the United States. I mean, one of Mr. Blinken's predecessors, Hillary Clinton, described meeting the Canadians as like being like like being going to the a, a board of directors meeting at a condominium corporation. She complained that we were always raising you know little domestic issues and it's this and that and all these things that when when you're talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, when you're talking about the geopolitics of Asia Pacific, when you're dealing with the crisis that's brewing in Iran. Uh, and its capacity to develop nuclear weapons. When you're talking about the Arctic and our mutual interest in defending our continent there, you're talking about meaty, important stuff. And that only enhances the relationship in ways that then pay dividends in all those other, you know, condominium corporation things. But we, we need to remember, like, you know, we used to say, well, it's, it's okay, you know, when the Republicans come back, they're, they're pro-free trade. And, you know, the Democrats lean a little bit on the union side and they can be a little more difficult, but we, we, we look at things alike. You know, what the world right now that we're in um, is one in which we have to have our eyes wide open. We have to be thinking about our own critical interests, the resilience of our supply chains, uh, because we don't know, uh, you know, if the government changes in the United States, uh, the rhetoric from uh, President Biden uh, may not be repeated by his successor. And we better be uh, fashioning a way to deal with that in a not in a hostile to the United States manner, but in in a, a Canada's interest first manner. OK, I have to leave it there. I appreciate both of you joining us this evening and the discussion. Former Foreign Affairs Ministers Peter McKay and John Manley. Thank you, both of you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.